Hi, I'm Michelle Shingler, the Editor-in-Chief of Forward Reviews, and you're tuning into Petit Forward, our bite-sized interviews with indie authors. Today we're speaking with Leif Anger, whose latest novel, I Cheerfully Refuse, releases on April 2nd. It's a magnificent dystopian story that follows a grieving bibliophile's sailing quest across the Great Lakes. Leif, thanks for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. So in the face of the challenges of a climate change world, including regressive governments and social constriction, Rainey and Lark uh, armed themselves with friendship, empathy, music, and books. What makes these tools so powerful in confronting situations that start? Well, I think, I think there you're talking about the roots of communication uh, between people, and that's at the heart of the story. I mean, friendship, empathy, books, music, um, those are the human version of the, the underground network of roots and filaments that uh, keep trees and grasses and moss of a forest healthy, like we read about in the understory. Um, right through drought and freezing cold winters and, um, and heat. So everything that threatens Rainy and Lark and Soul in this story, the scarcity and the social regression you mentioned, um, and holy wars and greed, all that's real, and it has a steep human cost. Uh, but humans, too, have really strong roots and root systems, and we nurture those with kindness and music and stories and art. And I think that's how all of us can kind of outlast the noise. Yeah. Uh, clear love for the Great Rakes region pulses through your pages as well. Can you talk about your relationship to these lands and what makes them so special? Oh, sure. You know, when I was little, um, I loved the idea of moving to a, a coast, you know, a saltwater coast, because nothing is more exotic to a kid from the Midwest than saltwater. <laughs> um, I never saw an ocean until I was 18. But I did have an aunt and uncle in California, and they would come back to the Midwest and see us in Minnesota every year or so. And they seemed just impossibly exotic and elegant to me. They were articulate and funny and optimistic and, and they were open to the world uh, instead of suspicious of it, which is kind of what I was used to. Um, so the coast had that appeal and, mm. and honestly it still does. But when I was in my twenties and thirties, uh, when we had little kids and I was working as a journalist for Minnesota Public Radio, uh, we started taking our family on these camping trips. And what we discovered was that there's this other coast. There's the North Coast. There's the Freshwater Coast, the Third Coast, all kinds of names for it. And what you find when you go out and you pitch your tent, in our case, on the North Shore of Lake Superior, which is out my door here, um, what you find is that anywhere along the Great Lakes, the ancient world is kind of at your doorstep. Um, you find bluestone cliffs coming up out of the sea, like something Homer might have told stories about. Um, you find trees that were here before white people. Uh, I remember walking along the shore of an island in the Apostle Island chain um, and stumbling, literally stumbling over the ribs of a shipwreck that went down in the very first part of the 20th century. And then you do some reading and you realize, oh, there are sturgeon, there are lake sturgeon in Superior right now that were alive when that ship went down. And they're gonna, they're still out there and they're gonna outlive me and, and probably you. Um, and so this whole region, the Great Lakes, just throbs with history and beauty and romance. And, uh, and so, yeah, I love the saltwater coasts, but this is where I've landed and no regrets. So Lark is convinced that the woman they meet when they're sailing along the lake's islands is the author of I Cheerfully Refuse, and the setting is magical enough to make it seem true. If you could meet someone in that mist, who would it be? Oh, man, that's such a good question. Uh, I think sometimes it would be this old uh, French essayist and philosopher named Montaigne who lived in the 16th century um, because he worked and lived in times of incredible sort of social unrest and wars and skirmishes outside of his door, and yet found a way to look at life and write about life uh, with, uh, with humor and uh, joy and forbearance. And if you read his essays now, they really stand up. Uh, you can't not be affected by them. 
But I think that today, uh, the person I'd most want to meet would be uh, the poet Mary Oliver, who just died a few years ago, and who I never met, uh, a regret of mine. But I think that Mary's ghost would be a, a delight to meet because she wrote so much gorgeous and accessible poetry, uh, poems that offer up kind of the creatures of the natural world in a way that we recognize ourselves among them and, and see that we're fellow citizens and that all of us are necessary. Yeah. I think I would want to eavesdrop on that conversation. I think you would be fabulous together. I think I would just ask a few questions and sit back and listen. Yeah. So I Cheerfully Refuse is the book within the book. It's the book that boys rainy when he's out on the lake. Uh, what book would be in your essential end of the world kit? Oh man. Um, well, Moby Dick, Moby Dick is the is the book I think I would take uh, just because Moby is Genesis. Moby has mm-hmm. everything. Um, it contains the world. It has the, the undersea universe of whales and cytology. It, it has the struggle between good and evil. Um, also a really surprising and sly sense of the humor. I mean, I laughed mm-hmm. all the way through it. Uh, beautiful language. And of course, it's all just swept along by the narrative voice of, of Ishmael, which to me sounds like the, the past. It sounds like the future. It sounds like the world we live in today. Um, so if I had a go bag, which I do not, uh, with a loaf of bread and a bottle of wine and one book, today at least, that, that book is Moby Dick. Fantastic. So Rainey, Kellen, and Soul face situations that would break most people in the course of this book, but you evade despair at all turns. How did you accomplish that? I think they evade despair, uh, Michelle, the same way I do, which is uh, I I go outside a lot. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, I wrote the first draft of this story um, in the spring and summer of 2020. Mm. Um, So full on pandemic, um, all the turbulence and protests surrounding the murder of George Floyd, um, everything just tearing itself apart. Um, I mean, despair was looking in every window we had, I think. Um, And what I found, and and my wife Robin too, is that uh, what we needed to do to keep discouragement at bay was was to get ourselves out out of the house, to get ourselves outside. We had to walk. And Duluth is is a great walking city any time of year, but during the pandemic, it got even better because nobody was really driving. And so all these streets just became wonderful, wide walking paths. Uh, every day you'd go out two or three different times and, and just walk under the canopy of the urban forest um, and beside the creeks that run down to the lake. And then of course there's miles and miles of lake shore you can walk beside. Um, and you see it at the same time, all these other people doing the same thing, out walking. And sometimes you, you just nod or you wave. Sometimes you'd have a conversation at a, at a safe distance. But every time we'd get home and we'd think, wow, what, what cool people we just met. So I, uh, I think the goodness of the natural world um, kind of seeped into us. And then we'd get home and I'd come upstairs here and, and work on the book. And because Rainey's story also takes place under an open sky and on the surface of the water, um, I think the same kind of inherent goodness and hopefulness of the world seeped into him, into uh, into Rainey as well, allowed him to escape the despair that beckoned. That's fantastic. So there's also a comet in your book. It's hurtling toward Earth. And that's also something that would send a lot of people into a tailspin, but for Rainey, is something that he looks at as a uh, hopeful future date. Uh, what for him does the comet signify? I think for Rainey, the comet means that that we aren't finished. Mm. I think for him, it means that the world is not about to end. Um, early in the book, he's talking to his good friend Labrino, uh, who's terrified of this approaching comet, the Tashi comet, because of what he thinks it might portend. Um, and that, Michelle, if you're interested, is a great rabbit hole to go down. Yeah. Uh, because comets have always been used by politicians and religious leaders uh, and everyday sort of neighborhood frauds <laughs> to, uh, uh, to justify wars and, and atrocities of every kind. Um, but Rainey looks at his friend and says, but man, think of where this comet has been. I mean, he thinks of it uh, differently than Labrino does. He's excited about this traveling space rock uh, for whom the Earth is just one more visit on its long paper route around the universe. And, um, I think to Rainey, it's like an exotic visitor. Yeah. Um, 
like like my aunt from California, kind of. Um, <laughs> I think that's what it is to him. Instead of being afraid of the unknown, he goes out and buys a nice set of binoculars so he can get a better look. Um, man, I just want to be like that. Uh, there, there's enough terror in this world the way it is. Thank you for all these wonderful insights into the book. Uh, it's gorgeous, and we're very excited to see how people respond to it. It's coming out on April 2nd. So everyone go out and pick up a copy. Everyone's going to be talking about this book. And Leif, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you so much, Michelle. Have a good day. You too.